Hey guys, sorry about what's happening with this, but okay. So we are going to read the last chapter of the book today. Um, when we were, uh, sorry, when we read last time for chapter five, pretty intense stuff was going down. Um, pretty much this is the chapter where Lenny um, accidentally kills uh, Curly's wife. So pretty much this happens and Lenny doesn't know what to do, kind of freaks out. And he, the one thing he remembers to do is to go to the place from the beginning of the book, the place that George told him to go to if he ever gets into trouble. So to the place where they for, they spent the first night before they got to the ranch. So Lenny leaves and goes back to that little, like the little river. And um, Candy and George find Curly's wife dead. And they realize that Lenny did it. And so George and Candy play it off as if they find out when all the other guys do. And once Curly sees what happened, he wants to go and kill Lenny. And we talked about he doesn't so much want to do it because he's so upset about his wife. He wants to do it so he could be like the big man on campus. He wants to do it so he can um, look better than Lenny and prove that he's more, like he's tougher, he's more of a man than he is. So the chapter ends with uh, Carlson realizing that his gun is gone and he thinks that Lenny has his gun. So they take George and they go off in this party to find Lenny and to see what happens. But okay, so here we go. The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had, le had left the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the, of the Gabalin Mountains and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side. And it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. A far rush of wind sounded and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides. The brown dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet. And row on row of tiny wind waves flowed up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. <clears throat> Suddenly, Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off down the river. The little snake slid in, slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. <clears throat> Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. When a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird, and then he dropped his head and drank again. When he finished, he sat down on the bank with his side to the pool so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountains seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget you, bet, goddamn. Hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George gonna give me hell, he says. He said, George gonna wish he was alone and not have me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountaintops. I can go off right there and find a cave, he said. And he continued sadly. And never have no ketchup, but I won't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll go away. And from then, out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. Okay, so this part's kind of weird coming up. It gets a little more weird as we go. But Lenny's like picturing this woman, his Aunt Clara, talking to him. So he's like, it's almost like, like when you picture like talking, like having a conversation with just someone in your head and you kind of picture like what you'd say back and forth. The only difference is he's picturing like he's actually seeing her like standing to the side and he's physically talking to her. She wore thick bullseye glasses and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets and she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her hands on her hips and she frowned disapprovingly at him. And when she spoke, it was Len Lenny's voice. I told you and told you, she said. I told you, mind George, because he's such a nice fella and good to you but you don't never take no care. You do bad things. And Lenny answered her. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. I couldn't help it. 
You never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He been doing nice things for you all the time. When he got a piece of pie, you always got half or more than half. If there was any ketchup, why, he'd give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All the time he could have had such a good time if it wasn't for you. He would have took his pay and raised hell in a whorehouse, and he could have sat in a pool room and played snooker. But he got to take care of you. Lenny moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills, and I'll find a cave, and I'll live there so I won't be no trouble with George. You just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that, and you know son of a bitch and well you ain't never going to do it. You'll just stick around and stew and the bejesus out of George all the time. Lenny said, I might just as well go away. George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits now. Okay, so this is where it gets weirder. Aunt Clara was gone, and from out of Lenny's head there came a gigantic rabbit. So he pictures like this huge rabbit that he's talking to that's yelling at him. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it wiggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him. And it spoke in Lenny's voice too. Ten rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard. You ain't fit to lift the boots of no rabbit. You forget him and let him go hungry. That's what you do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a greased jackpin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George had done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George gonna let you tend the rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's gonna beat the hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's gonna do. <clears throat> now Lenny retorted belligerently. He ain't neither. George won't do nothing like that. I've knew George since I forget when, and he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. He's nice to me. He ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you, said the rabbit. He's gonna beat the hell out of you and then go away and leave you. He won't, Lenny cried frantically. He won't do nothing like that. I know George. Me and him travels together. Okay, so Lenny's picturing these two people as Aunt Clara and this rabbit because those are two things that were important to him in his life. Like, his Aunt Clara, other than George, was the one that took care of him um, when he was a kid. And since she died, he's been with George. So he kind of, like, looks up to her as, like, an authority figure in his life and someone who loved him and cared for him. So he's picturing her saying all these things. And the same thing with, like, or even, I don't know if you guys have ever, like, if, especially when you were, like, a younger, like, a younger kid, um, like, if you did something wrong and you pictured, like, oh, my God, what will my mom say or what will my dad say or my older sibling? So it's kind of, like, the same thing. And so then for the rabbit, he's picturing the rabbit because that's the thing that he wants to do the most, like, in the world is care for the rabbits. He wants to tend the rabbits. So he's picturing this rabbit saying to him because it symbolizes a lot of, like, his want and his need and his desires of, like, what his most, like, his, like, deepest wish would be. So... And he's picturing them saying all these things because deep down, this is what he kind of feels about himself. So he knows that he's done something wrong and these are his actual fears. Like he's afraid George is gonna leave him. He's afraid George won't stay with him. He's afraid George is gonna be upset with him. And so it's manifesting in like this giant rabbit saying it to him. <clears throat> but the rabbit repeated softly over and over. He gonna leave you, you crazy bastard. He gonna leave you all alone. He gonna leave you, you crazy bastard. Lenny put his hands over his ears. He ain't, I tell you he ain't. And he cried, oh, George, George, George. George came quietly out of the brush and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, what the hell are you yelling about? Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't gonna leave me, are you, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No, I knowed it. Lenny cried, you ain't that kind. George was silent. Lenny said, George? Yeah, I done another bad thing. It don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, George? Yeah? Ain't you going to give me hell? Give you hell? Sure, like you always done before. Like, if I didn't have you, I'd take my 50 bucks. 
Jesus Christ, Lenny, you, can re you can't remember nothing that happens, but you remember every word I say. Well, ain't you going to say it? George shook himself. He said woodenly, if I was alone, I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous, had no emphasis. So like just it's completely toneless. I could get a job and not have no mess. He stopped. Go on, said Lenny. And when the end of the month come, and when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George. Ain't you going to give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away, said Lenny. I'll go right off into the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily, Tell me like you've done before. Tell you what? About the other guys and about us. George said, Guys like us got no family. They make a little stake and then they blow it in. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about them. But not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said, because, because I got you and, and I got you. We got each other, that's what. That gives a hoot in hell about us, Lenny cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind, wa wind waves flowed up the green pool. And the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. So it's like the group of guys coming. George took off his hat. He said shakily, take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine. Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer and the evening came fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, tell how it's gonna be. George had been listening to the distant sounds. For a moment, he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny, and I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slopes of the gabolins. We gonna get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. So really, so remember in the, in the end of chapter five, Carlson was like, hey, wh where's my gun? Where's my gun? Lenny must have had it, right? And George says, yeah, Lenny has it. When really George told Candy, hey, pretend like you just found this girl, come out and tell everybody else, I'll be right back. He goes to get Carlson's Luger. So George has had it the entire time, the gun. He snapped off the safety, and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river, and another man answered. Go on, said Lenny. George raised the gun, and his hand shook, and he dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it going to be? We going to get a little place. We'll have a cow, said George, and we'll have maybe a pig and chickens. And down the flat, we'll have a, a little piece of alfalfa. For the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, George repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits. And you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness. And live on the fat of the land. Yes. Lenny turned his head. No, Lenny. Look down there across the river like you could almost see the place. Lenny obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. There were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Go on, George. When are we going to do it? We're going to do it soon. Me and you. You and me. Everybody going to be nice to you. Ain't, ain't going to be no more trouble. Nobody going to hurt nobody nor steal from them. Lenny said, I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny. I ain't mad. I never been mad and I ain't now. That's the thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, let's do it now. Let's get that place now. Sure, right now. I gotta, we gotta. And George raised the gun and studied it. And he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jarred and then settled slowly forward to the sand and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun and then he threw it from him back up on the bank 
near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with cries and with the sound of running feet. Slim's voice shouted, George, where are you at, George? But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing and George was ahead, Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying in the sand. Got him, by God. He went over and looked down at Lenny and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. A guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it? He asked. I just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah, he had your gun. And you got it away from him and you took it and you killed him? Yeah, that's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you will go in and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink. Slim said, you had it, George. I swear you had it. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them. And Carlson said, now what in the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? Okay, super depressing ending uh, for a depressing book that was sad pretty much the entire way through with everyone just being sad. Okay, but so in the end, it's really depressing and I'm sorry to ruin your day. <laughs> But uh, pretty much in the very end, George says uh, he lets Carlson and everybody else think that Lenny had the gun still, that he wrestled it away from him, that he shot him. He doesn't tell them what really went down. He doesn't tell them that he stole the gun and that he killed Lenny and that Lenny never had the gun in the first place. And he does this because he knows that, first off, he doesn't want Carlson to know he stole his gun, but also he knows that none of them will understand why he did what he did. They won't understand why he killed Lenny the way he did and why he didn't just let Curly do it. Like they, they'll, they won't, it won't make sense to them. The only one that really understands is, is Slim because Slim knows their relationship and their friendship and he knows how much uh, George cared about Lenny and like that they kind of traveled together and they were friends and they actually like had someone that had their back. And I'm sure, and so the reason that this actually happens, the reason George does this, the reason that the guy, other guys other than Slim won't understand is that he knows that if you think about it, okay, say if he would have done nothing and just let Curly find Lenny, Curly definitely would not have killed him in a humane way. Curly would have wanted him to suffer. Curly would have wanted to make an example of him. Curly would have wanted him to know that he was better than him in the last minute, he would have made, probably shot him somewhere that was insanely painful. He would have probably let Lenny bleed out or just tortured him in some way before killing him and kind of like making a, he would have made like a spectacle of it in front of everybody. And George knows this. So he knows that the only way that he can save Lenny from this is to kill him himself because there's no way that the, guy, the other guys are going to let him off for this. And there's no way that Lenny could make it on his own. So he knows that this is the only real, real way to save him from this horrible end is to kill him, kill him himself. And Slim's really the only one that truly understands why. So Slim doesn't ever say that he knows why he did it. And Slim doesn't ever say that he probably knows that George was the one that took Carlson's gun, but it kind of is implied that Slim's the only one that really gets it. And um, the other guys, to them, it's just like, What's hitting him? Whatever, Lenny killed this girl, he deserves it. He had, to, he had to be killed, that's what had to happen. And they don't really understand the bond that George and Lenny shared because they've never had that and experienced that in their lives, like for themselves. So, the end, super depressing. People died and everyone was sad the whole time. So, okay, this is why I don't really care for this book. One of the many reasons. But okay, so um, I hope that you guys enjoyed it the best that you could in some way. I hope that watching me read it was better than just having to read it on your own or read a, an audio, listen to an audio book. I, I tried to make it as interesting as possible. So um, on Friday, there's gonna be the chapters five and six quiz. If you have questions for me about anything with uh, the either chapter, just email me. And as soon as I see your email, I will get back to you. Talk to you later.